Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship this morning. Not too many of us here yet, but I'm sure we're going to fill up as the minutes go by. Um, I've chosen the songs for this morning, and I've had lots of reasons this week, um, lots of different reasons, just to remember the promises of God and to remember his faithfulness to us and to realize how great he is and how wonderful his love is for us. So there's no other real reason for the songs than that. You'll know all of them, I think. Faithful ones, so unchanging. And then great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Great is thy faithfulness and the Lord's my shepherd. All songs that we can just sing, listen to, think about that remind us of how good God is and his amazing faithfulness and how his promises can always be trusted.
we draw closer to our main time of worship, we're just going to sing perhaps more quietly, The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. notices on slides. So there's a Skittles evening, speak to Nikki and Nick about that. Uh, we've obviously got Christian A week coming up. Hill House again, speak to Nikki if you want to know anything about it. And have a read. <laughs> no, you need to say more than that. Pardon? You need to say more than that. Go on then, Jim. Okay. Um, if you donate by envelopes, little yellow envelopes, well that's fine, but it would be better if you could set up with our uh, new co-op bank account. If you're happy to do that or you're able to do that, if you come and talk to me, I can give you the co-op bank account details and your money can go straight in and we won't have to use the yellow envelopes. It's just that the reason for it is that it simplifies administration and takes less time for people. I, well, no, everybody, you count as I'm treasurer. So if you're able to do that, then please come and see me. And uh, next Saturday is Strictly Worship. Um, please don't forget, it is an amazing event with some incredibly talented musicians. Um, and obviously God always shows up. So I'd just like to welcome Cathy and say thank you very much for taking our service. And we look forward to the message this morning. I wanted to stay there for the whole hour. Anyway, it's good to be here with you again this morning. We gather together to meet with our Lord, to refresh our faith, to learn new things, 
to be encouraged on our journey. So come, let us worship. We join in prayer. God of our journey, guide of our path, make us ready in our encounters with others to learn new things about you, for you are the God of surprises. In Jesus' name, amen. And let's continue our worship as we sing, We are gathered here, the time has come. We're gathered here, the time has come To praise the Father, Spirit, Son Hearts that are ready, free to respond We join the everlasting song We will worship you in spirit join again in prayer. As we come to you, Lord, and in praise and worship, the praise and worship comes from every nation, from all parts of the world, from one generation to the next. People praise and worship you. Today, here and now, Lord, we come to praise and worship you. We give thanks and praise, O oh God, for others who have known you, 
and loved you and followed you and shared their faith with us and journeyed with us too. That we have learned of you, sought you and found you and be found by you. That we are part of you and you are part of us that we can grow and mature in faith and hope and love, that together with others beside us, we can learn more of you, see you more clearly, and love you more dearly. With thanks and praise, we offer ourselves and pray that we may accompany others on their journey. Yet, Lord, we come in petting penitence for our journeys not shared with those who needed companionship. We come in sorrow for not walking and talking with those who needed us most. We come in sadness that we have let ourselves and others down and let you down when we have not accompanied those who have been searching for you. There are times when we could have done more. We could confess, we confess our failings and seek forgiveness, as we seek also to forgive those who have not walked with us because the burden was too heavy for them as well. In penitence, we seek forgiveness. Lord, hear our prayer. The Lord forgives those who repent their sins at their failings and faults, and the Lord travels with us on our journey of life. Amen. Let us join with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So, has anyone something to share about having seen God at work or having something happen that has helped them along in their spiritual life? No? Oh, dear. Oh, well done, Ian. Thank you. Jill and I use Lectio Divina as our um, devotions each night day. And this week it had in it the bit of it in John's Gospel where Jesus says that um, out of the hearts of us will come streams of living water. And I've always had a picture of that, you know, just a nice little dribble coming out. We were in Wales the week before and it had rained. And the river near us was bubbling over. And I just said to you, living water. But actually, the living water was not gentle. It was rushing and bubbling and mussy. And I think sometimes it's just saying, God was saying to me, your image of what I can do for you is far less than the power that I want to give to you. So that was the first thing I wanted to share. The other thing is to say that uh, I got a new toy this week. Oh called solar panels on the house <laughs> and uh, we were driving down to Radstock and I just said to, to Jill and Lizzie who were in the car God we're going up we're we're driving powered by sunshine which was were because our car had been charged from our panels but it was not just an uh, you know I go on bang on about the environment a lot but I'm not going to today <laughs> what I want to say is that I realized that all that power all that energy have been given to us as a gift by God. I'd done nothing to receive the power that was driving my car, except stick the panels that receive what he's giving. And it's not just 
our house that's powered by the sun. The whole planet is powered by that same source, but it's all gift from God. And it was just great to be reminded again of God's generosity and love. So on Friday, I travelled to um, near Birmingham to see Chloe for, for the weekend, well, for Saturday, Friday, Friday night. And I was actually a little bit anxious about driving, to be honest. And it wasn't long on the M5 when everything came to a complete standstill, and all I could see was black smoke everywhere. So both sides of the motorway completely closed. And um, I thought, right, I need, I need to pray over this, you know, as all the emergency vehicles are coming down and I just said you know about praying that everyone was okay so I mean as it was yes they were but while I was sat there waiting I was getting a bit anxious because I was I had an appointment to get to and um, I thought right I need to do something to keep calm so I put on my Lectio thing of the day and um, it was just so calming and so wonderful Everyone was getting out of their cars and just wandering around trying to work out what's going on. So, unknown to me, unthinking, I had my window open. And when I got out of the car afterward, they said, what were you listening to? And I thought, oh. So, uh, and they were actually quite, quite, quite pleased and they actually asked me about it. So, I'm hoping. Seed sown. Right, have I missed anyone? Because I'm very good at looking around and then not seeing... Aha, aha, from behind me comes. Much shorter. Um, just a really quick one. I had some medical appointments this week that went much better than we were expecting, so I'm very thankful. Well, I think I'll just... Oh, what were you going to say, my love? No, you're just waving your thing. All right, you just wave your thing. I don't care. <laughs> I think our only thing is that we suddenly had to take a friend into hospital and... And we were a bit anxious because he's very frail. And, um, uh, but it all went very smoothly, so I just thank the Lord for that. Right then, we're talking about journeying alongside others. And your little thing, Anna, was going to tie in just beautifully. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it was planned. Stepping out of your front door can be an adventure. Now, do you think of that as you step out of your front door? This is going to be an adventure? Wow. Apparently, Bilbo, Ro Bilbo discovered this in The Hobbit. I have read The Hobbit, but so long ago, I don't remember that bit. So have you encountered someone on a journey that has changed your life? Think for a minute of your own journeys and how traveling with others can bring new insights, friendships, and solace. I thought that was the, quite the harder one, but did anybody watch the pilgrimage in North Wales? I didn't. I wish I had, but I didn't. Um, but then that's more of a solace thing, isn't it? Um, I can recall many journeys when I've had good conversations. Every year I go into Bristol to a preparation day for the World Day of Prayer, and I usually go with some ladies from the committee, and invariably we have some good conversations. And then the other thing that came to mind was a uh, male voice choir weekend away on a coach and a conversation with Helen the um, wife of Reverend Martin Slocum, it came back to me how, I'm not going to say what was in it, but it was a good conversation. So what about when you journey with total strangers? Have you been on a journey with a total stranger? No? No? Would you ignore them or would you talk to them? Uh, what about you young people back there? Have you done some journeys and had some strangers? And So would you try and talk to them? Would you just ignore them? And if you tried to talk to them, what do you think you would say? Perhaps some of the adults have got an idea what they would say if they were on a journey and with strangers. 
I think probably the obvious one is where are you going? Why do you go in? You know, it could be that um, they're going to visit family or friends, could be a hospital visit, could be going on an interview for a job, all sorts of reasons. But what if you don't like journeys? Anna was, was apprehensive, and I can quite hang on into that. Um, how would you like, how would you, oh dear, what have I written here? How would you, if you're able to, not able to go on a, if you're not able to go on a journey, you're not able to go on a holiday. That's what I'm trying to say. And I caught this headline in the paper on an agony ant page, and it says, I'm always anxious when I book a holiday. Well, it struck a chord with me, because these days I do worry about getting there even with the sat-nav. I usually enjoy the holiday once I'm there, but it's a journey, you see, because I can't read very quickly, and Morton's driven past the junction by the time I've told us we've got to turn it. So it sort of winds me up a bit. And I'm quite relieved that I was not the only one that felt that way, that other people get anxious about journeys. In fact, the lady doing the reply said that as a journalist, she did not like having to travel. You see, one never knows what's round the corner. You know, there might be an accident that you're involved in, or somebody's involved in and you've got to do something about, or there might be a road closure. And, and aren't diversion signs wonderful things? They send you this way, then that way, and then you end up back where you started rather than where you need to go. And then, of course, there's vehicle breakdown when something goes wrong, or queues. That's the other thing. I was once told when I was traveling on my own to enjoy the journey. So as I went, I kept saying, enjoy the journey, and I found it helped. I'm sure God wants us to enjoy the journey of life and in the main, I have. Have you ever met Jesus on your travels? No, I've met very kind Jesus people. And we meet him through the people we travel with. We're going to hear a story from Acts of the Apostles about Philip's meeting with the Ethiopian court official and how that changed their lives. But for the moment... We are going to sing again, and then we'll, the children will take the offering, and then they will leave. So, 445, Lord, the light of your love.
So we're coming to our Bible readings now. Um, Philip travels with the Lord as, a, as he journeyed with the Ethiopian treasurer from a country with a Jewish tradition, later claimed to date from the time of the Queen of Sheba's visit to Solomon. Philip runs beside the chariot, but this high official is wealthy because he possesses a scroll of scripture, invites Peter to sit beside him, Philip rather, to sit beside him. Philip wants to be asked a question, waits to be asked a question about the passage from Isaiah before relating it to Jesus. So we hear from that. So this reading is from Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 40. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jer Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandak, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. <clears throat> the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of this descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is this prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my, <coughs> of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared as, as Tos and travelled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. <coughs> Thanks be to God. And now we go to a gospel reading from the Gospel of John, and it's that very familiar passage about the, the vine. Has anybody done any pruning recently? There are roses... Anybody got a vine they've pruned? No? <laughs> right, we'll, we'll hear about Jesus' story about the vine. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must re remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much more fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. Right, we sing again, this is time 302, I want to walk with Jesus.
so journeying alongside others. The words which I took notice of in one of my readings of the story of Philip and the eunuch was Philip was to go south on the desert road. I've never been on a desert road. Anybody been to a desert, a real proper desert? Oh, yes, yes. The pictures I see on the media and up there just look oh, daunting as to however do you find your way. The nearest I've been is perhaps on a country road in Dartmoor or, or Scotland. A desert or a wilderness road is barren. No water, no food, habitation, human or animals. It is a hard road to travel. One has to be tough and resilient. The road of life can be hard, and we have to be tough and resilient. Philip was taking a chance when he went out on the desert road, but he did it because God had guided him. Have you been in that situation where you feel guided by God, but it has become a tough road? In my teens, when I'd first given my life to Christ, I felt guided to come to Bath to do a catering course at the Technical College. That was back in the 60s. But it was a tough job, tough road, because A, I became homesick and depressed. Oh dear, I didn't know I was going to get emotional. <laughs> Yet God got me through it with the help of my family, my friends, and my college tutors. The eunuch was also traveling this desert road. He had been to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. He had the relative comfort of a chariot and probably a slave to drive it. Hence, he could read the words of scripture that he had found. But he found another desert. Reading part of Isaiah did not give him a clue as to what it was about or who the prophet was talking about. Well, I have read parts of the Bible and thought, what's this all about? Who's it all about? And I'm sure we all have. So we understand where the eunuch was. Then Philip turned up with no idea what God wanted of him, but spotted the opportunity to share the gospel, the importance of Christian life in relation to the Old Testament. It is easy not to spot opportunities to share Christ with others, who are finding life's road tough. But we should be open-minded that it could happen at any time and in any place. The Gospel reading from John is one of Jesus' parables, and, it, well, you could do a sermon on its own from it. So I wondered why these two readings were put together in the lectionary. Maybe you've been there thinking, what's the connection between these two? Well, my thought is the bit that says, remain in me and I will remain in you. To be able to do life's tough journey, one needs to remain in Christ and have the sustenance to stay on life's road to the end. The vine is often a symbol of Israel. So Christ follows would identify with his symbol and understand what he was trying to communicate. The importance of staying connected to Jesus and to God. The importance of pruning back to produce more good fruit. Thus, his Father God is glorified in the work of the Son and glorified in the work of the disciples. Lost myself. I'll get there in a minute.
I found myself questioning, do I glorify God? Do I bear much fruit? I'm not finding a very comfortable answer. It's a question maybe you might like to ask yourself as to whether you glorify God in life's journey. I found a bit of Tom Wright quite helpful, but um, the print's a bit small. Talk about strange journeys. Had a bit of a strange one. Went to see Tom Wright in Bristol in a big church. Went with some friends from here in the circuit. And um, we got there early, spread ourselves out in a pew quite near the front. And then suddenly a steward was asking us to shove up to make some more room because there were heaps and heaps of other people coming. And um, this young woman came and sat beside me. So she said hello, and I said hello, and she asked where I come from, so I said Midsummer Norton, and then I asked her where she comes from, and she said, um, well, I've just come back from Canada, and I'm living at Henley's, and my little brain went, tick, 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 I've heard something about this, oh, my cousin Rosemary, her daughter's just come back from Canada, and is staying in Henley's, so I thought, well, maybe I got it wrong, so I said, well, where did you come from originally? And she said, North Devon. So I said, you'd be Rosemary Friend's daughter then, wouldn't you? <laughs> so in all those people, in that big place, and the one seat there, I had a relative come and sit beside me. Life's journeys are funny, aren't they? So let's hear a bit of Tom Wright. <clears throat> Within the farewell discourses as a whole, this section of John opens up a new dimension of what Jesus wants to say. He takes his leave, of, as he takes his leave of one of his closest associates. He has already spoken to them of being in him, and as he is in the Father. Now we see more of what this means. On the one hand, it is a way of speaking of himself as Israel in person, and of the followers as members of God's true people because they belong to him. On the other hand, it is a way of speaking of the intimate relationship with him that they are to enjoy and to cultivate. Branches that decide to go it alone, try to live in without the life of the vine, soon discover their mistake. They wither and die and are good for nothing but the fire. But the branches that remain in the vine and submit to the pruner's knife when necessary live and bear fruit. That is the prospect that Jesus holds out to his followers and to all of us. The urgent question then is this, how do we remain in him? What does it look like in practice? Both of the meanings come into play we must remain in the community that knows and loves him and celebrates him as Lord. There is no such thing as a solitary Christian. We can't go it alone, but we must also remain as people of prayer and worship in our own intimate lives. We must make sure to be in touch, in tune with Jesus, knowing him, and being known by him. Once again, the most extraordinary promises about prayer accompany the sharpest warning. And though it always hurts, we must be ready for the Father's pruning knife. God is glorified, so we will be, by bearing good quality fruit and lots of it. But for this to happen, there will be extra growth that needs cutting away. That, too, is an intimate process. The vine dresser is never closer to the vine, taking more thought over its long-term health and productivity than when he has the knife in his hand. So there's a bit of Tom Wright to inspire us. Philip was an apostle that understood all of this of Jesus' teaching 
and was able to explain to the eunuch about the life and the meaning of Christ. Both were on their travels and both changed directions. Change, di changing directions is something that Christ can ask of us, but never without supporting us in that change. The Ethiopian courtier, Tori, the eunuch, came to Jerusalem worshipping us. <coughs> To worship suggesting Judaism was already established in Africa. Philip and the Ethiopian showed each other mutual respect and we can learn from dialogue with the church of Ethiopia. In the Amahara region, the remaining forests surround the Twikido church buildings, preserved as an act of faith for centuries as trees of life that bear fruit for the healing of the nations. The writer in Roots says, being in Africa had a profound effect on my life. I had come to teach, but ended up learning much more. Its people, accustomed to poverty, gave me a master class in hospitality generosity, and hope. When I visited student homes, there was always a meal and always a leaving gift. It was an in-between place, so I would not be able to stay there, but it became a spiritual home. I'm sure that Philip and the Ethiopia's, Ethiopian's official brief journey together in another in-between place had for them a similar resonance, for they met at a crucial time. Have we had similar experiences of in-between places that have grown our faith and our knowledge of God? As we journey alongside each other in our Christian life, we need to remain in Christ and Christ to remain in us. And we need to be open to the chance opportunities to share our understanding, limited though it may be, with others who are finding Christian, the Christian road a desert and tough going. That there may be in-between places where we share and grow with strangers. And when we think back to what we've thought about in worship today, let us think of the new things we've learned. Did we discover something helpful? And if so, what? And will it make a difference to our future journey with God? Amen. We join in a prayer. We travel the journey of faith, but do not go alone, for the Lord is with us. We travel the journey of life with thankful hearts, and the Lord is with us. We travel the journey of life with each other, and the Lord is with us now and always. Amen. Can't see your faces in me reading glasses, and I do like to see your faces. We're going to sing again now. Um, I've picked this one particularly for verse 3, and I haven't got the words here to read it out. Father, I place into your hands. One, three, three.
we join with prayers of intercession. Loving Lord Jesus, we think today of those whose hearts and minds are dominated by violence and war. The victims who have lost loved ones, lost homes, lost livelihoods, those who live in fear, those who are pursuing war, and those who are seeking peace. In their encounters this week, may they find wisdom, love, and peace. Loving Lord Jesus, we think today of all those who are struggling financially, those whose land is poor, whose crops have failed, those without enough money to pay for food and utility bills. We thank you for those who offer help through food banks, warm spaces, and credit unions. In their encounters this week, may they find wisdom, love, and peace. Lord Jesus, we pray for all those who are part of the health services, for doctors, nurses, healthcare assistants, and administrators. We thank you for the work done in our hospitals and health centers. And we thank you for those, and we think of those who use them because they are unwell physically, mentally, and emotionally. Maybe there's someone you particularly want to hold to God at this moment. in their encounters this week, may they find wisdom, love, and peace. Loving Lord Jesus, we thank you for all churches and communities of, worshiped, of worshipers, for the love and support they offer, and the teaching and prayer they provide. As a circuit, we think particularly of Polton today, and we just ask your blessing on each person there, witnessing to your love and your care. We pray for all who seek to share your good news with friend and stranger, that what they say may be heard, understood, and taken seriously. In their encounters this week, may they find wisdom, love, and peace. Loving Lord Jesus, we pray for ourselves and for those who are part of our lives. Those whom we see often and those whom we only encounter occasionally. For those we see face to face and for those we interact with by phone or letter or social media. For those who help and support us. And for those who need our help and support. In their encounters this week, May they and may we find wisdom, love, and peace. Thank you, loving God, for friends and casual acquaintances 
for those we know by name and those whose faces we recognize, for those who share our pilgrim journey in whatever way. Help us always to remember that in any encounter, you are present and offer your guidance and comfort. May we grow in and through you now and always. Amen. We've had some lovely hymns this morning and some great singing, and we're going to finish with 201, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, Pilgrim Through This Barren Land. Be our song of praise wherever we encounter. Guide us, guard us, and strengthen us. And the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us always. <laughs>